Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 10, and this is Session 75. In our previous session, we were talking about uh, a final aspect of prayer, and that was praying for others. Uh, we actually divided that up into a couple of, of uh, different components. And so what we want to do is kind of take up with that still in mind. Um, that aspect of praying for others, when I said it falls into a couple of components, I'm talking about the fact that the way we pray for others depends on what they know. And uh, because of that, we were looking at last time, and I just want to make this point to kind of springboard us into this lesson. Uh, when we're praying for other people, that is the call for us to get involved in whatever those prayers are about. Um, and so, with that in mind, uh, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul prayed for all those churches when he writes, in fact, in the Bible, uh, outside of David in the Psalms, no one has more of their prayers recorded than the Apostle Paul. And he is praying for all of those saints and all those different assemblies, and not only is he praying for them, but he is telling them he's praying for them. And then he goes one step further, and he tells them exactly what he is praying for them. And there's a reason for that. Now, normally, when someone says, to, you know, I've been praying for you, it's because you've been going through some type of situation, and um, they want you to know that they understand what you're going through, and they care about you, and so they say, I've been praying for you. Uh, the Pharisees prayed, but when they prayed, they made their prayers known, made them public, but that was for the purpose of appearing to be spiritual. Uh, and so... Uh, but when Paul is doing this, it is really different from both of those. I, he does actually care what they're going through. But the reason he is telling them what he is praying is for a couple of different purposes. And let me just give them to you. The first thing is, oh, that red one's not going to work very well. The first one is, and I'm sorry I don't have the PowerPoint today. If I had the PowerPoint, we could kind of just flip through this. But the first thing Paul is doing is, he is reminding them of the doctrine. In other words, he has taught them something that is supposed to bring them comfort in the midst of adversity. And when they're going through the various sufferings and persecutions and, 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 and the infirmities, and, the, and, by, and by the way, right now, what we're really talking about here is, uh, well, I'm going to introduce this in just a moment, but you know, those sufferings come in two types. There are the, can I just put up the acronym and we know what that is? It's the sufferings of this present time. The sufferings of this present time are what happens to people because we just live in a fallen world. It is not God doing something. He's not trying to punish us or get our attention. It's just, it happens to save people just like it does to lost people. And uh, it's just part of, of living in this world. That would be, and I know you know this, but someone's listening to the recording, and I just to make sure we're clear. The sufferings of this present time are, you know what, you, you get sick, uh, you're in an accident, and you're injured. Uh, maybe you contract some kind of uh, disease, some, things like that. Those are the things that we're talking about, and they happen to everyone. What you do is you, you try to fix it you know, somehow. Uh, and then you have the next set of sufferings, which is the sufferings of Christ. And the sufferings of Christ are only for those saints who are now beginning to live their sonship life to the degree that Satan's work in this world is being impacted. And so in order to get us to stop there are a series of attacks that the policy of evil has designed. And remember here, uh, was, it, was it last week or week before? I can't really remember now. But remember what I did when I took us through all of Paul's epistles? Do you remember that? No one remembers that? That's really working for me. Okay, so you remember we talked about in Romans... We have all that establishment doctrine. And then phase one, and so, and so if that's Romans, in, in 1 Corinthians, that's phase one 
of the policy of evil's attack is outlined throughout the book of 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians was phase 2. And, uh, and we talked about those eight categories of suffering. Uh, Galatians was phase 3. And I don't want to go back through all of that except to say, when we went through those books, what I was showing you is the, the, the actual phases of the policy of evil that where Paul is going to talk, talk to us about what the sufferings of Christ are going to be, the form that they're going to take, the order in which they're going to happen, and the doctrine which is the remedy for every one of those. So he's not just throwing us out there and saying, hey, by the way, the adversary is not happy with you and you're going to be attacked, and so good luck. But he's actually given us the doctrine that is able to uh, provide an armor for us in the midst of the sufferings of Christ. Well, so... I, I'm saying that to say that when you're praying about these, it is a different thing than praying about these. There, there are some differences there. Because these are in response to what you're doing. These are just because it is part of life. And, um, and, there, and, and no one is structuring the, or, or, or organizing those out. All right, so let me give us an example of this. Let's suppose that you have a friend that's going through a difficult situation. Maybe they've lost a loved one and they're grieving, and we would say, I'm praying for you as a way of saying, I, I care about you and I realize what you're going through. Just knowing that does offer a degree of comfort. But the point I want to make is, the comfort that that gives is very minimal compared to the comfort that your Heavenly Father wants to give you, but that comfort comes out of knowing something in God's Word and believing what He has written there and allowing that Word to work in us. That's where the real comfort comes from. And we're going to need that all through our lives. And so when we pray, we're praying in accordance with that particular doctrine which is meant to work in us. And so let's talk for just a moment about praying for what I'm calling fellow sons, folks who understand what we understand and they're working through the doctrine and they understand all about that. Uh, this is, takes us right back to what Paul was doing here. Every prayer that he is detailing, whether it's to the Romans or the Corinthians or the Galatians or the Ephesians or the Philippians or whoever, every one of those prayers are being prayed for someone who has some level of understanding in the doctrine. Even the Corinthians, who kind of turned back for a while, even they had an understanding of things in the doctrine. And so when Paul is writing to them, he is reminding them of things they should already know. There's a second thing that he's doing here, though, and the second thing that he's doing is, he is, by talking about his prayer, he is giving them a pre-doctrinal exhortation. All right, let's just talk about that for a second. Whenever you're given doctrine in the Bible, there's a couple of things that usually accompany it. The first thing is a pre-doctrinal exhortation. In other words... It is an exhortation that comes before the doctrine. And what is that designed to do? It's meant to alert you to the fact that you're about to hear something very important and you need to pay attention to that. And so Paul's prayers, when he's talking to them, look, when he's talking to them about something they already know, that serves as the reminder. But sometimes he's trying to give them a heads up for something he's about to teach them something they will need. They're in the midst of a circumstance, and, and whatever that circumstance is, Paul knows what it is, and now he's giving them Scripture that is actually now going to produce a peace in their heart and a comfort in their soul in the midst of that particular circumstance. You know the time to learn that? is before you're going through it. That's the best time to learn it. Because I have to tell you, when you're in the midst of it, it is hard to pay attention to that because of what's going on. So, 
that, that prayer, when Paul says, look, here's what I'm praying, and then he tells them what it is, if it's not something they already know, then that serves as the exhortation to say, because of the situation you're in, now I'm about to give you something for that. Now also, just to say it, with, after the doctrine, you have the pre-doctrinal exhortation, then you have the doctrine, and then so, many times following that, you get a post-doctrinal exhortation. And what is that one for? It is to tell you the application of what you just learned. It's to tell you how that's going to be put into use. Really, that's a, that's a nice way to package up the doctrine there. Okay. So let me talk, take you through a one, two, oh, I was going to do the PowerPoint. I don't have it. Mm, okay. So let me just take you through a one, two, three, four here because I want to talk about the mechanics of when we're praying for someone else, how that works, okay? So uh, let me, I've already got a one, two, three, four going, so let me do an A, B, C, D, and I'll just kind of walk you through this. By the way, the verse that we're going to be looking at here is going to be in Colossians chapter 3. But let's make the point first. When you're praying for someone else, you, may, you need to make a determination about what the doctrine is asking you to do. So, uh, I'm just trying to shorten that up a little bit. You're going to determine what to do. Because when you're praying for someone else properly, this is not how it works. Um, I dare God Clifford's in a real bad state and something's happening with him and I just wish you'd really help him out and bless him and, and cheer him up. And let that be it. See, we have that backwards. Prayer, when it is done properly, is not us telling God what He should go do. If that prayer is done properly, that is about getting on the same page with God and going and doing what needs to be done. I want to show you some verses about that. Mm -hmm. We have a problem here. Somebody's sick or, or needs uh, reassurance. Well, it's my way of thinking that as a church of God, prayer is how we bring the problem to his attention. <laughs> and then that separates it. Now, what I do is an act of God because I'm doing it on his behalf. It gives him the glory and not me personally. Right. Okay, right, right. And where does that come from? You're saying it. It comes out of the Scripture. Right, comes out of the Scripture. So you understand what Clifford's asking here. He's saying, how do I, how do I know the difference between some good thing that I just want to do on my own and something that the Scripture is compelling me to do? Well, I mean, the answer is right there in that. Uh, and you have to stop and think about that. Because plenty of us see a situation and you just want to stop and just help. And that's not a bad thing. But what you're being trained to do is to allow the Scripture to be able to produce those things in you. Because there is eventually... Mm, how am I going to say this? There is going to come a time where you're going to decide what to do and what not to do based on things other than why your Heavenly Father would decide that. Does that make sense? And so what God wants to do is instill in us the same motivation to do things that He has. That's when it is not only good, it becomes godly. And that's the difference. So there are lost people in the world who are charitable, and who sacrifice and do good things. 
but they don't do them for the same reason as God does them. And that's the, that's the critical difference. Because once we learn, remember what this whole thing is about. God, what, the three components of godliness are, is to learn to think about things like your heavenly Father thinks. To be able to live out of that godly thinking. So that our, what we do is what He would do, and we're doing it for the same reason. And then the third component, of course, is because we do these two, we're able to labor with God in what He is doing. Not out of our own righteousness, but truly out of the power of His grace at work in our lives. That's a different thing. And so you have to stop every once in a while, and you have to say to yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Because we grew up doing what? Just kind of doing things by the reflex of how something strikes us. You know, this is someone we care about, so we want to go help them out. But what we really want to do is we want the doctrine that is sitting in God's Word to so work in us that it transforms the way we think so that we are now looking at things the way our Heavenly Father looks at that. And although what, what comes out of that may be the same thing, and it may not be, but even if it is the same thing, it comes from a different source. And that really is the difference, bud. Well, I'm not quite. Well, what you what you said a while ago. Okay. Was I thought what you said was uh, that when we when we start to pray about something uh, that we that God is we're not we shouldn't pray it exactly like what you know we thought our heavenly Father would do. We need to do it independently based upon what our knowledge is our decision-making skills to, to pray for that. What to pray for exactly? I'm not making... I'm lost. Are you... I'm not... I'm, I know you... I know you have some... I know you're saying it, but I'm not following. Are you... Yeah, I don't... Okay, well, let me re-say it, and then, you know, maybe okay. it'll, get, it'll get clearer. Uh, if I'm, I'm trying to back up mentally to where I was when you were hearing that. So this first point, when we're praying about something, here's the thing I think we're not doing. I don't think we're cluing God into a situation because He already knows. So what is the prayer, what is the prayer for? Remember what prayer does. Prayer for others is meant to move us to action. That's what this prayer is doing. It's meant to move us to action. So, look, um, you know, uh, l l l you know, Clifford's starving to death over there at his house, and I know about it. I'm not going to go, dear God, Clifford really needs some groceries, and so I just pray you just fill up his cabinets in Jesus' name, and then that's it. His cabinets are not going to get any fuller from that. Ravens are not going to drop bags of groceries on his lawn. If God is going to do that, if God, no, and no manna, right. So if God is going to do that, here's how He has chosen to do it in this dispensation of grace. His body is going to do it. And He is going to do it through us. And how does He do it through us? That word, okay, can you just look, look at the Colossians verse. We'll, this is part of what we're in. I would put it on the PowerPoint, but here it is in your notes. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. So when that word, the doctrine, 
When that word begins to dwell in us, what is that talking about? It's talking about that word that, that was written on the page is now beginning to be lived in us. That's when the word is dwelling in us. And when that word is dwelling in me, when I see Clifford and I know he doesn't have any groceries, then I'm moved to do something about that because of what the Scripture says about that. Now, humanly speaking, anybody might want to do that, especially if they knew him. But see, I understand that here is an opportunity for me to live out of the doctrine. Here is an opportunity for me to put godliness on display. So I have to think, when I'm doing this, I really have an opportunity to do that. Not to just show everybody I'm a good guy. So how do you differentiate? You're living out of the doctrine or you're a good guy? How do you put it? Because what's here has to come from here. In other words, you have to be thinking about that doctrine. That's what's in your mind. And in the beginning, you have to do that on purpose. Until you establish that 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 becomes the default. Actually, okay, now Mark is saying, and that only... I was thinking prayer would activate the doctrine. Prayer does activate the doctrine, right. And that's what gets you thinking out of the doctrine. See? Is everybody following this? Okay. So, so what you're doing, when I, when I, when I see something... I could just do the way I've done it all my life. Well, that's not going to work. Clifford's over there without any food. I'd say to Bill, let's go to the grocery store and, and go get some groceries. I mean, I would just default do that. But now what I have to do is I have to say, look, this doctrine that I've been learning, is it really having an effect on me? Is it really impacting me? So instead of me producing it, how about that word dwelling in me richly. How about that doctrine now producing that godly thinking in me? And then someone might look at that and say, well then what's the difference though? I mean, you know what, if you, you say to do it like this, or someone does it on their own, the difference is, when I'm doing it because of the doctrine, that's Christ in me. When I don't do it out of the doctrine, that's my own self-righteousness producing that. And, and if I really want to learn to be godly, to think, live, and labor with my Father, then I'm going to have to learn to do it out of... Do, the things that I do are for the reasons that He would do it. So the only way to do that is to say, what's motivating me to do this? Can you look at... Look, in the beginning, let me tell you how this works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where prayer comes in. Yeah, so you're going to be talking to your Heavenly Father. Look, you just have to, I know it seems like I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but you have to stop and say, here's Clifford, he doesn't have any groceries. I'm going to starve you to death before the lesson is over today, I guess. I don't know why I got on that. But, but okay, okay. So, yeah, you got donuts, right. So, so if I go, Clifford is starved. In the beginning, I have to start saying, now, Father... What am I going to do about that? Because if I'm really interested in praying for him, then I've got to be interested in getting involved in that, right? Because I know, I know now that it's not good enough for me to go, oh dear God. But remember even Jesus talked about this. He said, when someone comes to your door and, they're, and, and uh, they're, uh, they don't have on sufficient clothing to keep them warm and they're hungry, and he said, and you, and you say... Depart, be ye warmed and filled. He said, what good did it do? Unless you give them those things which are needful. So we got to stop thinking, oh dear God, please help so and so. And now it's just kind of up to him. Because that's not how that works. So now that we know that, so now I have to say, and in the beginning you just have to go through the process and say, Father, here's Clifford, he doesn't have any food. I would naturally just want to go do something uh, for him. 
And I know because he is a fellow saint. I mean, would I do that for a lost person? Of course I would. But let's talk about who he is. Because he's a fellow saint and how I'm supposed to feel about him, I want to get involved in that. So for Clifford, he really has... Okay, I'm... I'm the reason I'm halting about it is because I'm, I'm going to ask you a question and I don't want to give you the answer, which I'm famous for doing so because I, I just can't stop talking. So here it is. What is Clifford's need? Okay, food. Yeah. He also needs the word to dwell in him richly. Also, doesn't he? And what, what would that produce in Clifford? Let me ask you a question. Did Paul ever go hungry? Yeah, he did. And so what was his attitude in that? Were there ever times when the churches weren't supporting Paul and he did without? Yes, there were. And do you remember what he said to that? Look, since we're talking about it, this doesn't do us any good if all I do is structure a sermon for you and we don't get to understand this, right? Turn over to the book of Philippians. And let me just show you this. I sure hope I'm going to be able to pinpoint this correctly. Uh... I am looking in, Paul is going to say something about their care of him. Um, there was a time when the Philippians were, were supporting Paul and then they weren't anymore and, and, and then they began again. And Paul is talking to them about that issue. Um, I'm sorry, where? What chapter? Chapter 2, verse 20. Let's see. Uh, that's close. That's, that's, that's not quite it. Um, He's going to say, your care of me hath. Uh, okay, here it is. It's at the end. It's chapter 4. Okay, now take a look with me here and let's start reading in um, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. In other words, he said, I know you wanted to, to help, but you, for some reason they didn't have an opportunity to do that. And as he said at the start of the verse, he said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want. He said, the reason I'm rejoicing that your care of me has flourished again is not because I had some wants or needs or there are things I lacked. Look at, now let's keep reading verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And he says, notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. But he's going to talk about, uh, okay, that's still not the exact one I was after, even though this is the issue, because what he's going to say is, the reason that I'm really glad that your care of me has flourished again. Oh, I wish I could just see the exact verse there. It may still be in this chapter, but I, I don't want to take any more time with it. It's not because of him, but because that meant that that word was working in them. 
And that's what he was rejoicing over. It wasn't Paul saying, Oh, thank God what you did for me. I just really needed that. 17. Is it 17? Yeah, yeah. He says, for, look at 16. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. In other words, here's what Paul was saying. Look, I, I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to be without. And I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He said, but you, the fact that you have done this is a sign to me now that that word, that doctrine, that scripture is now working in you. And guess what? This is the fruit of it. That this is not you guys just sitting over there saying, well, we sure hope God helps Paul out. But they found a way to do that. And he is rejoicing that that word is dwelling in them. So what does Clifford need? He does need food. He needs an edification. Yeah. And he also needs to be encouraged in the doctrine he already knows. So would it be, would it be right that when you went over there with bags of groceries... That you would say, hey, we've been praying for you that the grace of God will be sufficient for you even in difficult times. But as members of the body, we have an obligation to help relieve that condition to the best that we can. The Philippians did it for a while. There was a period when they couldn't. And then there was a period where they could. But the thing about it is, they didn't forget the doctrine. In other words, they didn't stop doing it because they just kind of got tired of it. They lacked opportunity, Paul said. But now that they had it, that was in their mind because of this. And Paul was saying, well, I greatly rejoice that your care of me has flourished again. Not because I desired a gift, but because this, talk, this shows me that that is working in you. You see? So there's a, there's, a, there's a twofold thing that's going on there. So when we're praying, so now let's bring this back to what Bud was talking about. So when we bring that back and we're talking to our Heavenly Father, isn't it right to say, well, it's pretty obvious Clifford needs some groceries, but what else does he need? How can I encourage him in this? Look, I mentioned this over and over, but you remember when you had the wreck? You are in the hospital? I get up to the hospital, you're, you're back there in the back, and when I walk back there, the first thing I said was, well, here's an opportunity to build your joint heir inheritance. And do you remember what you said to me? You said, we were just talking about that. Well, look, you know, all that was, that was just a reminder. That was just a reminder. But you guys are already thinking about that. See, that's glorious, isn't it? So all I'm saying is, when Paul is saying to them, hey, I've been praying for you, and I'm praying that, and then he outlines what this prayer is, he is, in some cases, reminding them of the doctrine that should be working in them. You're going through a... And, and why would he need to remind them? Just think with me for a moment. Why would anybody need to be reminded of the doctrine? Because when... Tragedies happen, they tend to steal our attention away to focus on, you know, the suffering rather than to remember the doctrine that we have learned. Sometimes you just have to be reminded, right? I mean, it just, it's sometimes it takes you by surprise. And you just need to be reminded. Plus, isn't it an encouragement to realize there are other saints that understand what's going on here that know the things that you know. Because believe me, when you're on the outside looking in, it is real easy to see what you should be doing. Sometimes it's hard in the midst of the storm to kind of get your feet back under you. And so, uh, and, and so this is, these are the two things that Paul is doing. So now, back to does that straighten any of that out about the prayer?
because we're dealing with somebody that has something in common with the way what we know. Right. But having to deal with somebody that doesn't. Right. That'll be next. Yeah. Yeah. That's we'll we'll talk. Yeah. That's a that's a different animal. Yeah, that's okay. I see where you're, what you're saying. For the recording, Bud is saying, yeah, I understand when you're talking to someone that knows the doctrine like you know, that's one thing, but what about someone that doesn't know any of that? And that's what you were saying, Clifford, at the end of the last session. You said, well, those people that don't understand any of that, that's different, and it is very different. And your prayer for them is going to be with a different intent. So, and we'll talk about that today, too. Okay, so let's do number two. So to the best of our ability, the next thing we do is we, we in other words, yeah, I shouldn't have said it that way for the first one. I, I, I know I, I did that. I was trying to get that condensed down. But you know what you're really doing here is you're having a discussion with your Heavenly Father about what's going on out of the doctrine, and you can only do that to the degree that you can do it. Does that make sense? Don't think that it's worthless because you don't know everything yet. You just function out of the doctrine that you know. And then part of that is to do what I was just asking the question about. What are the needs that are here? In other words, what is it this person needs? In the case of with Clifford, we were saying he needs groceries. But he also needs something to happen in his inner man that will keep him from being overwhelmed by his circumstances and getting depressed and, 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 and just, you know, get, get, getting overcome by a situation. And so we determine what those needs are. The next thing that we do is we'll now, the next, and I have it there in your notes, as we talk to God about the situation, we make a sonship decision about how we will help. And I want you to look at it this way. If you're really doing this out of the doctrine, let me cross out the word help. How we will labor, take this one, right there. How we'll labor with our Father to help our friend. Because we are going to be doing this out of what He has taught us. That makes sense? So, and then the last one is, <laughs> uh, it's kind of simple. Go do it. Once you've figured it out, go do it. Is it possible that you have an idea to the best of your ability, you know, about what to do, and then later you think, oh, you know what, I, I should do this. Isn't that possible? Well, of course. You understand this is a sonship skill that you're developing. The more you get involved in this, the more familiar you are with it. Now look, this is, so, so this is very different. So now, now let me take you to the next Colossians verse, which is the next verse, Colossians 3.17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now I want to talk about that highlighted phrase there. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Remember what the previous verse said. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And the next thing he says is, right here in verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Now, what does it mean to do something in the name of the Lord? Anytime you do something in someone's name, you are asserting the right to act on their behalf. I watch those movies sometimes of, you know, back in the days of knights and, you know, medieval times. And you always have the soldiers coming and banging on someone's door and then open up in the name of the king. What are they saying? They're there on the behalf of the king's business. They're there representing the king. Well, guess what? When you do it in the name of the Lord, you know what you're actually doing? You're there on the Lord's business. You're there on the Lord's behalf. So when he says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, when this doctrine is working in us, 
when the Word of Christ is dwelling in us richly, then what we're doing out of that, it truly is on the behalf of the Lord Jesus. Because the way He has designed it is not to come down from heaven Himself and do it. He's not going to come down and give Clifford groceries. But He's going to use the fellow members of His body to do that. And that's the way that is supposed to be. Okay, so I know our buzzer went off, but let me kind of get, let, let me kind of get to the, the, the end of this thing if I can. And that is, uh, so when we tell people that we've been praying for them, and we tell them what it is that we're praying, if it is fellow saints who understand, then we are doing one of these two things that Paul was doing. We're either reminding them of doctrine that they have already learned, or... We're about to introduce them to some doctrine that they need for the particular situation that they're in. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to round this out. So let me get to these questions right here. Uh, no, no, change my mind. Because what we'll do is we'll take the break and we'll come back and then we'll talk about that other group. What about folks that don't know that? How do we pray for them and what would those prayers be like? So we'll come back and we'll pick that up after the break. Okay.